Father in heaven, we come before you this evening. We want to thank you for your goodness. Father, we want to testify that you are good and we are but dust. And we glory in your marvelous condescension in sending your Son, your only begotten Son, into the world to save sinners of whom we are chief. Father, tonight as we open your word, we are going to ask that something supernatural will take place here, that you will give us a supernatural, extraordinary experience with your Spirit. Father, I'm going to do my best tonight. You made my mouth, you made my tongue, and so I pray that the words will be eloquent. I pray they will be the right words, the most piercing words. But Father, at the end of the day, in the final analysis, we need your Spirit to be here to pierce through hardened hearts, to pierce through indifferent hearts. And Father, for those hearts that are here, that are receptive, to give us a stronger, more grounded sense of the love of God. Father, be with us tonight. As we open your word, may you open our hearts. For we ask it in the marvelous, mighty, glorious name of Jesus. Let everyone say, Amen. Well, I think I might have just mentioned this this morning. Um, prior to becoming a Christian, I was a punk rocker. Now, I, I got into the punk rock thing because a friend of mine named Timothy Johnson, his dad was a colonel at the Air Force base that my father was stationed at as well. Okay, my dad was in the Air Force, and uh, we were stationed in the same area, and he lived just down the road, and he was a punk rocker. He was several grades older than me. I was probably 12 years old, 13 years old, and he was probably 15 or 16, and he had blue hair and yellow hair, and he would wear, you know, kind of raggedy clothes and safety pins, and I knew he had plenty of money. It wasn't a matter of, you know, they couldn't afford these clothes. That's just kind of the way he dressed, and he lived just down the road, and so I became his friend, and one time he invited me to a show, to go to a punk rock show. Well, I'd never been to a punk rock show before I was a 13-year-old kid. Well, somehow I, I talked my mother into letting me go, and I came to this show, and I'd never seen anything like it in my whole life. I mean, there were just crazy, radical, amazing, strange people there. Lots of them. And they had these bands up there. And I remember one particular girl that I got to know very well. Her name was April. She had like a three-foot-high punk mohawk. And uh, she was the singer for one of the bands, Social Joke. And just, bah, 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 just singing. And I was like, whoa, just taking it all in. Well, anyway, I, I became a punk rocker somehow in the course of events, and that was really what I was. That was my persona. And eventually, I got involved in punk rock bands and started singing. We didn't really sing. We more screamed, but it was called singing. And it was actually called music, which I think is debatable. But I was in that scene for a number of years. In fact, until I became a Christian, I was a full-on punk rocker. And... Um, when I first became a Christian, it was very difficult for me to sing because I was so accustomed to being in bands. I was in bands since I was 17 years old. I was converted and I was almost 24. So for, for the better part of seven years, I was like a screamer, right? And uh, when I first started hearing Christian singing, it was totally new to me. I wasn't raised really in a Christian context. And uh, I was taken by it. I enjoyed the singing and I wanted to learn how to sing. Well, I was working in this vegetarian restaurant. In fact, it was the very vegetarian restaurant that I had gone into as a vegan straight-edge punk rocker. I don't know if that means anything to you, but I was a crazy vegan straight-edge punk rocker, and I went into this vegetarian restaurant, and uh, all the people there called one another brother and sister. And I thought that was the strangest thing. The ladies generally wore dresses, and they were so pleasant and so nice, and I was a very abrasive person. And it's funny because I would go in there with blue hair, pink hair, yellow hair, red hair, no hair, long hair, dreadlocked hair, crazy hair, you know, piercings everywhere, tattoos, dressed, you know, slovenly. And I thought they were weird. <laughs> I thought these people are the weirdest people I've ever seen, but they loved me. And they treated me like, you know, they just treated me very well. And all of my friends that went in there and um, anyway, the long and the short of it is, is they gave me this book called The Great Controversy. You've probably never heard of it. It's an old book. And... <laughs> Anyway, I ended up reading that book, and I can tell you that I, I literally read that book, and in two weeks, God changed my whole life. Can you say amen? 
I mean, I, I, my, every single part of my life, every single thing, from my language to my girlfriend to my interests to my music, I mean, every single part of my life, except my dietary habits, I guess. Because I was a vegan before and I was a vegan after, right? And so uh, everything changed, just literally overnight, right? Well, I went to work. I was actually studying medicine at the University of Wyoming. That's what I wanted to do. I wanted to be a doctor. And uh, you think, a punk rock doctor. Well, sure, why not? <laughs> so I, I decided to take a year off. I told my dad, you know, Dad, I want to take a year off of school. And uh, this is actually my father's alma mater, the University of Wyoming. And he, at the time, was the vice president of a university. Very pro-education. And I was doing very well in school, A student, you know, top of my class. And, and so when I told my dad I wanted to drop out of the pre-med program, that would cause me to lose my scholarships and just take a year off to study the Bible. He thought that was a great idea. He, he really supported that decision. Do you think? No, hardly. And so what ended up happening was I had to move in, not because my parents kicked me out, but because it was just such a tense environment. I moved in with the people that owned the vegetarian restaurant, and I started working at this vegetarian restaurant, right? And so I'd be like in the back washing lettuce, and I wanted to learn how to sing, right? And so I loved the singing. I just sounded so nice to me, and I, I, I wanted to learn how to sing this song, Amazing Grace. You've heard the song, of course. And I'd be in the back there washing lettuce, and I'd say, Amazing Grace, and I couldn't do it. And the lady that owned the restaurant, who's just the nicest woman ever, she could sing, of course, like an angel, and she'd come back and she'd do the very wrong thing to me. She would laugh at me, <laughs> right? Because she could sing like an angel, and I, I couldn't even carry a tune in a basket. So she'd come back and she'd say, you'll never learn to sing. You know, she used to kind of mock me. And by the way, if you're ever singing next to someone in church who sings like a frog, like, tell them they sound beautiful. Give them a little encouragement, okay? <laughs> So I was back there and I just couldn't sing and I just couldn't sing and I just couldn't sing and I kept trying and trying and in my car, you know, I just belled it out. I was like, amazing great. And it just, it never quite came out right. But over time, I learned to sing. And one day I opened my mouth and I said, amazing grace. And I was like, whoa. <laughs> I said, Mary, Mary, listen to this, you know? And I actually was able to start singing, and then I wanted to learn the song Blessed Assurance, and so I learned to sing that song, and, and then I just came to love singing, which, by the way, I don't believe it when people tell me they can't learn to sing. I think anybody can learn to sing if you really try, and you're willing to just be vulnerable and, and just humble yourself and try it, right? It worked for me. And so here's the thing. Ever since then, I love to sing, and what I like to do in my own personal devotions is spend time singing. Right? I spend some time singing, just myself. You know, most of the time people sing in a congregation. But it's not very personal, is it? Is it? I mean, okay, think about singing in a congregation. You sing at the end of the church service. And you're singing because everybody else is singing. And you can have a worshipful experience. I'm not suggesting that you can't. But singing is truly powerful and truly awesome when you are by yourself singing to Jesus. And it's just incredible. And so, oh, I suppose about six or seven months ago now, I was singing through the hymnal, because there's many hymns I don't know, but I like to sing through the hymnal. And I came to this song, 162, in the hymnal. It's, What Wondrous Love Is This? You know that song? What wondrous love is this, O oh my soul? What wondrous love is this, O oh my soul? What wondrous love is this, O oh my soul, that would cause the Lord of bliss to bear the dreadful curse for my soul. Now, as I was singing through that, it, it, it dawned on me that the author of that hymn was struck with what he perceived to be a radical imbalance of exchange. Hear what he's saying. He said, what? What, what wondrous love is this? Uh, uh, what wondrous love is this, oh my soul, that would cause the Lord of bliss to bear the dreadful curse for me? And there in my devotions, as I was singing this song, I got to thinking about the idea of value. The idea of what, everyone? Value. And, and also the similar ideas of, of worth and this idea of exchange. Clearly, that's what the hymn writer was struck with. It, it didn't appear to him to be a fair exchange. I mean, the Lord of bliss bears the dreadful curse for me. There seemed to be an imbalance of exchange there. I got to thinking about that idea. And so what I do is something that I love to do. I went to the dictionary and I looked up the word worth. 
Love the dictionary. And I, I looked up the word worth, and this is what it said. The value of something, especially in terms of money, the amount of something that can be bought for a particular sum of money or that will last for a particular length of time. Worth. So, so really the whole idea behind this idea of worth is the idea of exchange. The idea of what everyone? Exchange. So we might use the word this way. We might say potentially you're going to buy a car and you look at the car and you say uh, what's the price on the car and the person says the price is $10,000. You might say that car is not worth $10,000 to me. Basically what you're saying is I don't feel that I'm getting enough bang for my buck out of the car to cause me to want to spend $10,000 worth. Another idea of worth is, is not just in terms of money but in terms of time. Someone might say it's worth it for me to finish my postgraduate degree. It's worth it for me to do that. Or someone might say this relationship that I'm involved in, this, this is a good use of my time, it's worth it for me to be involved in this relationship. This idea of exchange, I give something and I get something and if what I get back is of sufficient value then it's worth it. Are we all together everyone, yes or no? So the idea of worth is the idea of exchange and the idea of value. Now, in discussing the idea of worth, it is important to understand something that is very, very central to the concept of worth, and that is this. Worth is subjective. Worth is, what did I say, everyone? Subjective. That is to say that the worth of something or the value of something is determined by the one who is willing to pay the price for said object. Does that make sense, everyone? Yes or no? Okay, never was this clearer to me than in the days just before my wedding. Now my wife is sitting right over there. She's the prettiest girl in the whole... Why don't you stand up, sweetie, so we can all look at you. Just try it. Come on. There she is. Isn't she beautiful? Absolutely beautiful. And uh, by the way, by the way, when I met my wife, this is a true story. When I met my wife, I, I asked her to marry me six weeks after the day I met her. And astonishingly, she said yes. It's a true story. You know, it was, anyway, I knew she was the one. I don't necessarily recommend this course of action to any of you. Um, but it can work that way if you're fully surrendered to the Lord Jesus Christ, and she was, and I was, and we just wanted God's plan. But anyway, here's the point. After I asked her to marry me and she said yes, you know, I'm thinking like in a couple weeks, right? I mean, I'd never been married before, so I didn't know that we had this whole process. And, uh, so what happens is when you get married, then you're in, when you, when, when you ask and she says yes, then you're engaged. Right? Are you with me on this? Let me give you a little lesson. Okay? Then you're engaged. And, and that process of engagement can last for months. I know, it's hard to believe. I mean months. And so I asked her to marry me and we set a date that was almost seven months later. I couldn't believe it. I mean, to me, I was like, seven months? What do we do in the meantime? <laughs> so... So I was one of those guys that just wanted to get married. Like, I didn't care about the details. Ladies, I'm sorry. I, like, I didn't care about the color of the bridesmaids dresses, the... I mean, nothing mattered to me. You know, if we got the little cutting device that had our name on it, you know, what the cake was. I mean, I, I cared about nothing. All I cared about was that at the end of the day, April 4th, 1999, I was married to that woman. That was like, that was it. That was the bottom line for me, right? So one of the things that you have to do when you're getting ready for a wedding is you, you have to rent tuxedos. You with me? So my wife is from Northern California. Northern California. And right in the area where she lives, there's a lot of sort of wealthy, affluent people. There's vineyards and there's a lot of money in that area. And she lives just down the road from a town called St. Helena. Has anybody here ever been to St. Helena, California before? Okay, so you know the kind of town it is. Okay, you know what I'm talking about. So it's kind of like sophisticated, posh, you know, hip and... So anyway, we, we let, went through the little uh, directory there, Yellow Pages, and we called a, um, a clothing store that rented tuxedos in St. Helena. And so we went there in order to rent the tuxedos, right? We, we called ahead. They said, yeah, we rent tuxedos. You have to come in and look at the catalogs. Okay, so we went down there. We parked our Honda Accord between the Mercedes and the BMW, <laughs> right? And so we go inside, and uh, the lady meets us there at the door, and, and Violetta goes with her over to look at the catalog. Now, by the way, this wasn't just any old clothing store. This is a clothier. <laughs> Do you know what a clothier is? It's a clothing store. <laughs> but, 
but it just has kind of a funny name. It's a clothier. So we went to this clothier to rent tuxedos, and when we got in there, Violetta goes over to the counter there to spend time with the person to sort of look and decide, you know, what color is the cummerbund and the tie and how long, all of that stuff. I could care less. So I just start looking around, right? I'm, I'm just in this clothing store, and I start looking around. And right off the bat, I spot, uh, there's some jackets there, because it was a men's clothing store, clothier. There was some blazers there, kind of an English looking, like a tweed, like almost a herringbone style, with the little leather patches on the elbow. You with me? I mean, it looked okay. I mean, it looked all right. I was, you know, I was interested in it. And the way that I shop, by the way, is I, I figure out what something costs before I decide if I like it. <laughs> Are you with me? Like all the ladies didn't get that. She's like, what did he say? <laughs> no, no, no. So if, I, so if I'm walking along in the mall and I look through a store there and I see a pair of shoes, here's, what, here's the thought process I go through. I see the shoes and I think to myself, I think I might be interested in that pair of shoes. I might be. There's the potential that I could be interested, so I'll go in and see what they cost. And so I go in, and I turn the shoe upside down, and if it says $150, I don't like them. Right? Well, those are the ugliest shoes I've ever seen. But, but, it, but if it says $29.95, then I might like them. Then I can make the decision. See, so first, I know the cost, and then I decide if I like them. So, so that's just a very intelligent way of shopping, by the way. I'd recommend you try it. So, I go into this clothing store there, and there's all of these blazers hanging in a while, my, hanging in a uh, row there. My wife is up front talking to the lady, and I look at the blazer, and I think, well, I might be interested in liking this. Might. So I look at the, the tag on the little sleeve, and I look at it, and I think, there's a misprint. <laughs> it's a misprint. So I look at the one behind it, same thing. And I'm thinking, two misprints. Look at the third one, same thing. So I look at the back of the jacket to see if there's like a, like a jet pack or something, you know, see if there's maybe like some Kevlar reinforcement, nothing, just a wool jacket. $5,000. And it like wasn't even that nice looking. And immediately I knew we were not going to buy our tuxedos. We were not going to rent our tuxedos from this place. So I thought, well, this will be fun. You know, obviously my wife has not got to the bottom line with this lady, so I'm just going to wander around the store and just have a little fun. So I go over to the shirts, white cotton button-up shirts, just like the one I'm wearing here today that I think I paid 14 bucks for at Ross Dress for Less. <laughs> Amen, come on. $600. Belts, $500. Shoes, just off the charts. So I was beginning to wonder if there was anything in the store I could actually afford. And I went over and there was this little wicker basket. <laughs> and there were socks in it. And it wasn't the three pack, it was the one pack. $72. Now, while I'm sort of having this, you know, this, this little exercise here in, in just absolute amazement, it dawns on me. I have this eureka moment. Wait a minute. This place is open for business. Are you with me? See if you follow it. I thought, wait a minute. People must shop here. <laughs> right? Doesn't that make sense? I mean, people must shop here. Otherwise, they wouldn't be open for business, which must mean then that somebody else, not me, Maybe one of you. Somebody else would go into that same store, they would see those same jackets, and they would look at that same price tag, and they would see that same price, and they'd think, huh, what a great jacket. <laughs> and it's only $5,000. <laughs> so, so they'll try it on, you know, and stand in front of the three-way mirror, and you know, sweetie, what do you think of these? Oh, that looks really nice. That, that'd go well with your khakis, and, and it's only $5,000. You know, we'll take two, <laughs> right? And we'll pick up a few shirts and a belt and some socks while we're at it. I mean, there, there must be people that spend that kind of money for those things. Now, listen carefully here. To me, no blazer is worth $5,000. Are you with me? It's not worth it. Let's say that together. It's not worth it. But is it worth it to somebody else? And that's the point. So the whole concept of worth and value, the central component in worth and value is that it is subjective. That's point number one. There's only two points tonight, so you'll get it. It's a piece of cake. Okay? So worth is subjective. Let's say that together. 
Worth is subjective. Another way of saying that is this. The one who is willing to pay the price for an item determines its worth. So far, so good? So to me, it's not worth it. But if somebody else looks at the same jacket and says it's worth it, to them it's a deal. The one who is willing to pay the price determines the value or worth of an object. Now with this backdrop in mind, remember the hymn writer, what wondrous love is this, O oh my soul, what wondrous love is this, O oh my soul, that would cause the Lord of bliss to bear the dreadful curse for me, for me? With that imbalance of exchange and this idea of worth, this context of worth in our minds, let's open our Bibles now to the Gospel of Matthew. Matthew chapter 13. Now that's the first book of the New Testament. Matthew chapter 13, you'll find it. And Jesus here is speaking in a parable. He's speaking in a what, everyone? A parable. Now, Jesus frequently spoke in parables. And people wonder why Jesus spoke in parables. Why didn't he just say it straight out? Well, one of the reasons that Jesus spoke in parables is he had the impossibly difficult task of communicating a world that was so totally, radically different from our own to people who'd never seen anything like it before. Have you ever visited another country or just a, yeah, another country, that's a good illustration, that you've never been to before and it, you, you had culture shock. You're like, wow, I've never seen anything like this before. Anybody here ever had that experience? Okay, so then when you go back and try to explain that country, the ambiance of that country, the ethos of that country to someone who's never been there, is that easy or difficult? It's very difficult because how do you describe the smells and the tastes and the way that the people carry themselves? Well, think of Jesus. Jesus has lived in a non-fallen universe. That is to say, in a sinless universe. And here he comes to explain to these stiff-necked, obstinate, hard-hearted, hard-headed disciples the glories of an unfallen universe, and they have nothing with which to compare it. Right? They have no context to understand a universe without sin, a universe without pain, death, disease. I mean, they, how are you going to explain that? Jesus had a significantly uh, difficult task here, didn't he? Yes or no? And so he frequently would speak in parables. You'd find him saying the strangest things. He'd say things like this. He'd say, the kingdom of heaven is like... The disciples are all waiting with bated breath. And he'd say, the kingdom of heaven is like... Um, it's like ah, a mustard seed. <laughs> and the disciples would, would say, what did he... What? Did he say like a mustard seed? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And Jesus is on a roll now. It's like a mustard seed. And, and, the, and he would just start to explain it. And the disciples are just like, no kingdom on earth is like a mustard seed. So, so Jesus had this difficulty of explaining the celestial realities to people that had nothing to compare it with, nothing, no referent. And so he would frequently begin his parables by saying things like, the kingdom of heaven is like. Now look in Matthew chapter 13. Matthew chapter 13. Now, Jesus sometimes told very long parables. Like in Luke chapter 15, you have just three parables in the whole chapter. Very long parables, like the parable of the prodigal son. But some of Jesus' parables were very short. And here in just three verses, we have two parables. Three verses, two whole parables. The first one is in verse 44. Matthew chapter 13, verse 44. Look at the language. Again, the kingdom of heaven is what? The kingdom of heaven is what? Like. like. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The kingdom of heaven is like. A treasure hidden in a field which a man found and hid. And for joy over it, he goes and sells all that he has and he buys that field. One parable, one verse. Verse 45, again, the kingdom of heaven is what, everyone? Like a merchant man seeking beautiful pearls, who when he had found one pearl of great price, he went and sold all that he had and he bought it. The kingdom of heaven is like this guy and he's walking through an out-of-the-way field and as he's strolling through this out-of-the-way field, he stubs his toe on something. And it doesn't feel quite like a rock, it doesn't feel quite like a tree root, and so he looks down to investigate it and it looks unusual. Something about it grabs his attention and he begins to sort of excavate there and as he digs apart, he realizes it's something man-made. It may be a box or a sack and he, as he pulls it up, he finds a treasure. Now, this was not uncommon in the days of Jesus. Jesus is describing something here that could have happened reasonably routinely in his days because today if you had a treasure, you'd put it in a bank or you'd put it in the stock market. You likely would not go hide it in a field. But in those days, Jesus himself said, hey, don't put your treasures down here on earth because a thief could take it or it could be rusted or a moth could eat it up. And so if people had something that they wanted to keep secret, they didn't want thieves to be able to get it, they'd go, not uncommonly, to a, you know, an out-of-the-way field, they'd bury it, and that would be like their safety deposit box, and it would remain there 
until they either went and retrieved it, but what happened if something happened to them and they died? So the treasure is still there, and so it was not at all uncommon in the days of Jesus for someone to find someone else's treasure. And Jesus says, hey, the kingdom of heaven is like a man walking through an out-of-the-way field who stubs his toe on something, looks down, and finds a treasure. Then he goes home, he tells his family and his friends he's going to liquidate all of his assets so he can buy that one field. Now let me ask you a question. How do you think that looks? How do you think the liquidating of all of his assets to buy one piece of property, how does that look to those who were not there to see the treasure? Wise financial decision or unwise? Probably unwise, right? They'd say, oh, you, the poor choice. You need to diversify your, your stock portfolio, right? No, don't put all your eggs in one basket. But he could try to explain to them what he had found, but they might try to discourage him and dissuade him from making that decision. Now, what does this parable mean? Well, I think it's pretty simple, really. When we, walking through this field called life, encounter the gospel, when we run into Jesus, we are willing to liquidate all of our assets so that we can obtain Jesus. C can someone say amen? amen? I mean, listen, Jesus has a way of turning your whole life upside down. Come, someone say amen. amen. Jesus is not like a little caboose that you nicely, neatly add to the end of the rest of your life. If you truly want a radical relationship with Jesus, it changes everything. Right? Yes or no? And so, so when you encounter Christ, everything is, everything is on the table. Everything is up for grabs. I mean, you are willing to do whatever you feel God is calling you to do. And that can look very irrational to people who have not seen the treasure that you've seen. Yes or no? Okay, so I've already described to you that I was in the punk rock world and uh, et cetera, et cetera. Now, in my, community of fa in, in my community, rather, you could have been anything and people would have accepted it. You could have been a transvestite. You could have been a homosexual. You could, have, you could have been anything and people would have accepted you. But in my community, if you became a Christian, this was like the highest form of treason. So when I became a Christian, my friends ceased to have an interest in me. Are you with me, everyone? Yes or no? Okay. And when I became a Christian, even the direction of my vocation started to change, and I started thinking that maybe God was leading me in a different direction. Everything was on the table. My friends thought I was crazy. In fact, my friends used to say, don't talk to David Asherick, to some of my other friends, don't talk to David Asherick, he's been brainwashed. To which I would always respond, invariably respond, my brain could use a good washing. <laughs> Are you with me? But all of my friends, they, they, didn't, they could not understand because they hadn't seen the treasure that I'd seen. My father couldn't understand. My own brothers and sisters couldn't understand. And so too with you. If you really make a radical heart commitment to Jesus, there is a very good chance that people around you are not going to understand the decisions that you're making. Someone say amen. amen. But you are so smitten, so taken with the treasure. You lay it all on the line. Isn't that right? So I think that's what the parable's teaching. I think when we encounter Christ, when we encounter the gospel in the field, we say, it's all on the table. My career is on the table. My education is on the table. My relationships are on the table. My enjoyments and recreations are on the table. Everything is on the table. Jesus, what do you want me to do? I believe that that is exactly what the parable is teaching. But I also believe that this does not exhaust the interpretive possibilities. Apparently for this man, the treasure was worth it. Was what, everyone? Because notice the Bible says he goes and sells it for joy. In other words, we're not supposed to feel sorry for him. We're not supposed to say, oh, too bad for that guy. He liquidated all of his assets just to buy that one field. He's happy about it. He cannot wait to do it, even though people around him may or may not understand. Are we all together, yes or no? Now, with this framework in mind, take one of these ribbons if you have it, put it right here, or a pen, or a finger, or whatever you have, put it right here, and go with me to 2 Corinthians chapter 4. Remember I told you there were two basic principles in this presentation. You've got one, now let's go look at the other, 2 Corinthians chapter 4. First principle is that worth is subjective, that the one who is willing to pay a price for an object determines its worth and its value. If that makes sense, say amen. Okay, now, check this out. Second principle. It is nearly always the case, it is nearly always the case that the contents of something is worth more than the container that it's in. Are you with me? It is nearly always the case that the contents of something is worth more than the container. 
Okay? So think about this. Um, a bank. Why do people rob banks? Right? Not because of the superior architecture. Right? People rob banks because there's money in there, right? So what makes the bank valuable? On the, what's on the outside or what's on the inside? It's on the inside. That's exactly right. Th think, of, um, think of a coffin, right? What's more valuable, the outside or the inside? Yeah, well, what's on the inside, right? That person, there's a person in there. How about a box of candy? Now, I love to say that one because, like, all the health reformers are like, the box, you know? <laughs> <laughs> But for the rest of us, we'd say the candy, right? You go, you go right down the list, and it is nearly always the case that the contents of something is worth more than the container that it's in. If that makes sense, say amen. Okay, so follow this analogy in 2 Corinthians chapter 4. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, and notice with me verse 6. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, I'm in what verse, everyone? Verse 6. For God who commanded the light to shine out of darkness has shown in our where? hearts to give us the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. Verse 7. But we have this treasure in earthen vessels that the excellence of the power may be of God and not of us. Simple analogy. Paul says, the same God who in the beginning said, let there be light and there was light. The same God who in the very beginning said, let there be light and boom, light flooded the then dark universe has now spoken into an equally dark, equally voided, equally vacuous location except now he's not speaking literal light. He's speaking the light of the knowledge of the glory of God. Where? Into the sinned, hardened, sin darkened heart of mankind. Are you with me everyone? So he says, for God who commanded the light to shine out of darkness has shown in our hearts to give us the light of the knowledge of the glory of God. Where? Where is it? What's God like? How can we know what he's really like? In the face of Jesus. And then he says, and we have this treasure. What treasure, Paul? Well, of course, the treasure in context is the light of the knowledge of who God is. And we have it in this jar of clay. Paul obviously is referring to himself as the vessel. We have the light of the knowledge of who God is. Do you realize how totally privileged you are to know who God is? Amen. Can you say amen? amen? I mean, there are people in this world who are absolutely blinded by the darkness of superstition and all kinds of paganism. They think that God is some austere, vindictive, exacting creditor. We know who God is. Is that something important to know in, the, in this great enterprise called life? Yes or no? Amen. That's the most important thing. The most important thing is who is God, and the second most important thing is who am I? You know who God is, and Paul is basically rejoicing. He says, we have the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus, and we have it in earthen vessels, in ourselves, that the excellency may be of God and not of us. So here's a good illustration. Let me grab this thing. All right, so here's a juice container. This will work really nice. I have to hold it like this, I think, so they can't tell what brand it is. Okay. So, so, so basically, here's the analogy. Here's the analogy. We're like this juice container, but what's inside of the container is the knowledge of who God really is. The light of the knowledge of the glory of God, God's character and His essence. Can you say amen? Okay, and so, so what would be more important then? The juice or the container? Of course, the juice would be more valuable. And so too, so too in this scenario, you would think. Now remember that I said that it is usually the case that the contents of something is worth more than the container. But I, I actually said that one time when I was preaching and I made the you know, mistake as a preacher of saying it's always the case. Right? As a preacher you learn to never say never or always because somebody invariably is going to take you to task, right? And so I've got this guy that comes to my church. He's a doctor. He's a neurologist. Very intelligent man but thinks about things in a different kind of way. And uh, he's a great guy. I love him very much. Dr. David Gaston. And uh, so anyway, Dr. Gaston, he always, you know, he, when he comes out, he's got some little pithy thing to say to me, you know, about the sermon. Some little, you know, anecdote to sort of, you know, stick it to me a little bit. And so I had said, the first time I ever preached this presentation, I said, it's always the case that the contents is worth more than the container. It's always the case. So here comes Dr. Gaston. He says, Pastor, I thought of an example of where... The, the container is worth more than the contents. And I thought, okay, well, here we go. Every Sabbath, something every Sabbath. So I said, okay, Dr. Gaston, what is it? And he's a doctor. He's a neurologist. He thinks very intelligent, intelligently, but very differently. And he said, your bladder. <laughs> Are you with me? And I was like, 
I'll give you that one. Okay. So now what I say is, it's usually the case. Okay, now watch this. Watch this. The light of the knowledge of the glory of God. That is who God is. My Bible says God is love. Where was the love of God best shown, most epitomized? I'm hearing it on the cross, that's right. If you wanted to distill the essence of the Christian faith down to a single event, it would be the cross. Amen? Amen. What is the message of the cross? In a sentence, this is the message of the cross. God valued sinful humanity more than his own existence. That is the message of the cross. When Jesus cried on the cross, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani. From Jesus' perspective, this was a terminal event. As Ellen White says in that marvelous volume, Their Desire of Ages, she says that Jesus could not see through the portals of the tomb. For Jesus, this was a terminal event. He said, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? The message of the cross is that God valued sinful humanity more than his own existence. Or to put it another way, God would rather go to hell for you than live in heaven without you. Paul says we have this treasure. The light of the knowledge of the glory of who God is, the essence of who God is, and, and that is best ex exemplified there on the cross. He said, we have this in a jar of clay. Where the jar of clay? So just think about that. Now, remember what I told you? It is nearly always the case that the contents of something is worth more than the container, but the message of the cross is that God valued this, this container more than what's in it. What's in it is the character of God. The very essence of who God is, the message of the cross is that God valued the jar of clay more than himself. Are you with me? So I guess that's another example where according to God at least, the container is worth more than the contents. Now with that in mind, go back to Matthew chapter 13. Let's go back to Matthew chapter 13. And let's look at that parable again. Let's just check it out again. Let's see if we couldn't find another gem in here. I think there's one. We've already discussed the man is walking through the field and he stubs his toe on a treasure and he looks down and he says, what is the treasure? He excavates. It's some incredible, awesome treasure, so much so that he's willing to liquidate all of his assets to obtain that one thing. Are we all on the same page, everyone? Yes or no? And we say, well, what is this amazing treasure? It's the gospel. It's the Lord Jesus Christ. And when we find Jesus, we're willing to give up everything for the Lord Jesus. Can someone say amen? amen. But what if that's not all the parable is teaching? What if there's something even better? What if there's something deeper that undergirds this parable that's even more profound? Let's look at it again. Verse 44, Matthew 13, 44. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a treasure hidden in a field, which a man found and hid, and for joy over it, he goes and sells all that he has, and he buys that field. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant man seeking beautiful pearls, who when he had found one pearl of great price, he went and sold all that he had, and he bought it. Something about that pearl, something about that treasure caught his eye. Never seen anything like it before. It was unique. So I'm reading through this book called Christ Object Lessons. It's an old book. You've probably never heard of it. And I'm reading on page 118. Listen to this. The parable of the merchant man seeking goodly pearls has a double significance. Oh, really? I'm all ears. A double, what kind of a significance? Double. What does double mean? Oh, so it has two significances. Okay. It applies not only to men as seeking the kingdom of heaven, that's what we've already said, but to Christ as seeking his lost inheritance. Christ, the heavenly merchant man seeking goodly pearls, saw in lost humanity the pearl of great price. In man, in David, defiled and ruined by sin, he saw the possibilities of redemption, hearts that have been the battleground of the conflict with Satan and that have been rescued by the power of his love are more precious to the Redeemer than, in those, than are those who have never fallen. I could go so far as to add here, if you would allow me, that, that those who have been redeemed and rescued by the power of his love are more precious to the Redeemer than himself. 
Now this parable gets a lot more awesome because the essence of this parable, and I got a little secret for you, the essence of the gospel is not primarily about what you give up. It's about what Jesus gave up. Well, that is a paradigm shift. What? What, what, what? So the center of religion is not about my sacrifice, but His sacrifice. So here's Jesus. Jesus is the man walking through the field. Jesus is the man looking for that goodly pearl. Jesus walks through the field and He stubs His toe. He looks down. It's not a rock. It's not a tree. It's not a root. Does a little excavation. It's a treasure. Treasure. He lifts it up. Yeah. He's looking at his treasure. It's you. He knows that treasure will cost him everything. Jesus is the man walking through the market. Comes upon a man selling pearls. So let, let me see your pearl collection. He's looking through the pearls. Oh, those are nice. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Let, let me see that one. Oh, Jesus, this is a very expensive pearl. No, I'd like to see that pearl. Can I please see that pearl? Uh, Jesus, this is a very expensive pearl. Well, what's the cost on that pearl? Uh, the cost on that pearl, Jesus, is everything. That, that will cost you everything, including your life, Jesus. Uh, I'd like, there's something about that. Can I see that pearl? Okay takes that pearl. It's you. Cost me everything, huh? Everything. He says, I'll take it. I'll take it. What if the essence of the gospel is not about what you give up, but about what Jesus has given up? Jesus found you. Jesus paid an infinite price for you. If Jesus paid an infinite price for you, then it must follow that you are worth an infinite amount. Oh, but you protest. No, not me. You don't know me. You don't know everything about me. I'm not worth that. But wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. Value is determined by the one who is willing to pay the what? Price. You are not the determiner and arbiter of your value. God is. God has determined what you are worth. And God looks at you and He says, He, she is worth an infinite, everything to me. Now we live in a society that tells you that you are worth such and such based on a variety of external things. Uh, for you ladies, if you look just right and you have this certain figure and blah, 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 then you're worth more than those who perhaps don't, right? This is society. And the guys, you know, you are worth your accomplishments and your career and what car you drive. You can actually add to your value. You can add to your worth. And if you don't have the things that our society deems as important and as central, then you don't possess the same kind of worth as those who do. But God looks at you just as you are and He says, He is worth everything to me. She's worth everything to me. I determine her value. I set her value and I am willing to to pay it all. Amen. Have you ever bought a lemon? Has anyone here ever bought a lemon before? Not the citrus fruit. A lemon, you know, a car that, that broke down. Anyone? Or something else. You bought a computer and it was a piece of junk. You bought it on eBay. You thought you were getting the deal of a lifetime and it was a piece of junk. Go ahead, raise your hands, you Consumer Reports readers. You know you've been gypped before. Now, do you know why you bought a lemon? You bought a lemon for one reason. You didn't know. You didn't know it was a lemon. That's why you bought it. On the dealership lot, it looked so good. You drove it out. It looked so good on eBay when you, when you got it. And then when you actually had it in hand, it broke down. You bought a lemon because you didn't know. But wait a minute. God knows. God knows. When God paid an infinitely high price for you, beloved, He knew exactly what He was getting. 
He knew you were a lemon. And he bought you anyway. You are worth the very life of God. That's the gospel. God valued you more than his own existence. That's the gospel. Don't try to add to it. Just accept it. What are we going to say to that? You know what I think we're going to say? I think we're going to say, what wondrous love is this? <laughs> what wondrous love is this? What what wondrous love is this that would cause the Lord of bliss to bear the dreadful curse for my soul? For me with all of my faults and fumbles and failures, hypocrisy, shortcomings. What wondrous love is this? In closing, there's a person here today who has never accepted the Lord Jesus Christ as their personal Savior. There's a person here today, at least one, probably more, who have never in their heart of hearts, in the innermost core of their being, understood the price that was paid for them and that they can't add to it, they can only accept it, that God knows you're a lemon, He bought you when you were a lemon, He knew what He was getting, and He did it anyway. Stop trying to be what you're not and become a child of God. Does God want to take you? Does He want to transform you? Does He want you to be obedient? Yes, 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 yes. But all of that comes after you have a radical encounter with Jesus and you realize He laid it all down for that treasure He found in the field. And that treasure is you. So where's that person? Where's that person who wants to say tonight, Jesus, I accept the infinite price that you paid for me. I don't add to it. I can't explain it. But tonight, I accept it. Where's that person? Would you stand for me? Where is that person at? I know you're here because I prayed about it. There you are. There you are, sister. Where is that person? There you are. Stand up. You're, you know you're that person. This would be the time to stand up. God bless you, sister. God bless you, sister. Who else? Stand up right now. You accept it. Infinite price paid for you. Somebody else? God bless you, sister. What wondrous love is this? Amen? Let's pray. Father in heaven, we can't explain it, but we believe it. And we accept it. For those who have stood a fresh, new, real, tangible realization that their value is not wrapped up in who, what they do or what they have or don't have. Their value is wrapped up in the price that was paid for them and that price is the very life of God. Father, we marvel. We, we, we stand back and we say, what wondrous love is this, O oh Father? Thank you. Thank you. We are lemons, and you knew it. And you desire to make us into something more, something better, something grander. 
But Father, help us to stay grounded in the great fact of the infinite price paid for us when, as Paul says, we were still sinners. In the mighty, marvelous, amazing, wondrous name of Jesus, let all of God's lemons say, Amen.